I'm going to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled First Miracle. We're going to, we're going to study today about the first miracle that Jesus did. You'll find it in the book of John chapter 2. I'm going to begin at verse 1. It says, In the third day was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Well, that's good advice right there. Whatever he says to you, do it. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, hide your word in our heart. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. You can be seated. We're reading here about the first miracle that Jesus did. They're really interesting verses. When Jesus was around 12 years of age, the teachers of the law were amazed at his Bible knowledge. But that wasn't a miracle. That wasn't considered a miracle. There's a lot of people that are really sharp. They knew Jesus was very sharp. But this was his first miracle when he turned water into wine. And it's very significant. I mentioned to you earlier, when I first read these verses, some questions arose in my mind that I just didn't quite understand. The first thing I wondered is why did Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, speak to his mother in the way that he did? Jesus, they have no wine. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Doesn't that sound kind of short, a little, little sharp to his mother? Now, I've read some uh, translations that say, well, really what it means is dear lady. Well, it don't sound like dear lady. I know that if you are Hispanic and you tell your mother, woman, <laughs> a shoe is flying in your direction. Get ready. Okay. I mean, just get ready to duck because, you know, you don't address your mom that way. And that's what it says he said. He said, woman, what have I to do with it? It was almost like, uh, like she offended him in some way or something. He, he responded kind of differently. And, uh, and she just ignored him. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. It was almost like he was saying, you know, why are you telling me this? Why is it my responsibility? You know, they're the ones that didn't buy enough wine. <laughs> you know, what are you coming to me for? It, it seemed like he was a little, you know, perturbed by it. And then he says, mine hour is not yet come. What was he talking about? A lot of folks would say, well, he was saying it's not my time to do miracles. But then, you know, four minutes later, he did a miracle. So was that really it? I used to wonder about that. Well, his time hadn't come. And then two minutes later, okay, now, and now it's come. It's like, man, you should have been nicer to your mom <laughs> because she was pretty close, you know. It, it, just didn't, it just didn't make sense to me. It was a, a little bit confusing. And... Uh, <clears throat> So I tried to research it a little more to figure it out. And, and, and then there was something else that was a little strange to me also. And that was the six water pots. It, it tells you the story that there were six water pots. And I remember I, when, years ago when I was studying that, I knew that those water pots were significant because there were six of them. And the number six, six is significant. It's man's number. It's when man was created. It's man's time on earth. Uh, you know, after six days, after six millenniums, man's time is done. And then on the early morning hours of the seventh millennium, that's when Jesus will return for his bride. And this is at a wedding. And, and I knew they had something special about them, but I couldn't figure it out. So I went back to the book of John, and uh, I thought maybe to help understand this better, we need to build a foundation. And, and so that's what I did. And I'm going to show you that now. Uh, we're going to go back to John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, in John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, you'll see that the book begins by talking about two individuals. It's letting us know who they are, and what their purpose is. <clears throat> in John chapter 1 verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus has always been here. How do we know that? Because he was in the beginning with God. And he is God. <laughs> That's what it says. It says Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. It was, was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the, the life was the light of man, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, or the darkness couldn't understand it. It couldn't overtake it. It couldn't comprehend it. 
It had no, the darkness had no power over the light. And then it talks about another man. It's talking about Jesus. Then it says, there was a man from God whose name was John. Now we're reading about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. He came to bear witness of Jesus. That all, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lightened every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. See, John is, is describing Jesus. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. The son of God became a man so that men could become the sons of God. Jesus died that we might live. That was his purpose for coming. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He said, Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's God in the flesh. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Notice it talks about the glory of Jesus. Jesus is going to be glorified. Full of grace and truth. John... Bear witness of him. Notice we're talking about Jesus and John here. And cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He's a reflection of the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? See, the, the teachers came to ask John, John, who are you? Are you the Christ? And he said, I'm not the Christ. There's one coming after me who's better than I am. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. This guy's a big deal. <laughs> John told him, I baptize with water, but he's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. My baptism is temporary. You know, the cleansing, the water, it was like a washing away of sin. When you were baptized, it was like you were, you know, crucified with Christ. And now you come up in a newness of life. But the water is a temporary cleansing. Jesus would be a permanent cleansing. And John identified Jesus. He told the world who he was. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I symbolically wash your sins away with water, but this guy is going to shed his blood for the remission of your sins. You, you know, my forgiveness is a temporary thing, but his is permanent. He's a big deal. These verses are so amazing. They tell us that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. G, uh, John goes on to tell everyone, this is the Lamb of God. He, he is the one. He is the Lamb Slain from the foundation of the world, before God made man, he knew that Jesus, his only begotten son, would die for our sins. He is the lamb that will be slain. He is the, the lamb that will be crucified. He'll suffer, die, and, and be buried, but then he'll rise again and forgive our sins. He's greater than John. He's, he, he's not worthy to uh, tie his shoes, John says. I baptize you with water. But this guy is more powerful. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. In other words, when people have faith in the Messiah, they get baptized in water, which is a picture of the washing away of our sins. But it's just a picture. The true baptism is when you accept Jesus as Lord and his blood was shed for you. That's permanent. Amen? The water was temporary. The, the blood was permanent. And John points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a powerful statement. It's telling us who these guys are. And what their function is, why they're here. I remember hearing a story years ago about a pig, a cow, and a chicken. The cow and the chicken were having a conversation. And it looked like an important conversation, so the pig walked up and said, Hey, what are y'all talking about? And the cow said, We're talking about how hard we work here on the farm. And about what our function is here. He says, I'm a pretty big deal. And so the cow said, I'm a pretty big deal. And the pig said, What do you mean? He said, Well, when the farmer gets up in the morning, he likes to have a cold glass of milk. And he likes to have toast with butter on that toast. 
And he likes to put a slice of cheese on that toast. He said, I provide him that milk. It's because of me he can make that butter. It's because of me he makes that cheese. And the chicken said, yeah, he also likes to have scrambled eggs with his toast. And I provide those eggs. We have a commitment. We, we, we sacrifice for the farmer. That's what we do here. And the pig said, you sacrifice. He said, when the farmer wants ham and eggs, one of us has to die. Hello. It's a different commitment, isn't it? Amen. John said, I baptize you with the water, but this guy, it's a pretty big deal. He's going to give his life for you. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. See, Jesus was going to pay the ultimate price for his bride. Jesus shows up on the fourth millennium on God's calendar, the fourth day, if you will. And that's when he suffers. He's crucified. He died and he's buried. And then three days later, he rose from the grave. And that signified that the sins of mankind were paid for because the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and he came back out. See, if the high priest wasn't worthy, he'd die in the Holy of Holies and, and they have to drag him out. But they, they would wait. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, they would wait to see if they'd hear a sound. They were, they were listening for the bells on his garment. And, and, and when Jesus was suffered, died, and was buried, the disciples went and they, they began to pray. And it says, and suddenly they heard a sound from heaven. Whoo, amen. It meant the high priest paid the price. Jesus suffered and died and he was buried and he paid the price. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. He, he, he did that so that, that his bride would be worthy. He'd cleanse us from all of our sins. And then he rose again on the third day. <clears throat> and I found that if you study the book of John, you actually see a, a pattern. You, you actually see a prophetic message in, in the book when you first start in John chapter 1. Let me, let me begin it right there in John chapter 1, verse 19. We, we just read up to that verse. It says, and this is the record of John. He says, I'm going to give you a record, so, so keep track. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. You know, John told him, I'm not the Christ. I came to prepare the way for him. I'm going to identify him. I'm going to tell you who he is. This is the record. So, and this is day one. Somebody say day one. We're seeing the, the pattern that things are going to take place. And then they continue to ask John questions, and they finally leave him. And it says in verse 29, the next day, this would be day two. Somebody say day two. Day two. This is day two. You can mark it in your Bible. It says the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And you continue to read about Jesus and John after this. And then in verse 35, it begins with the words, again, the next day, what day is this? This is day three. We have this record that they're giving us, the record of John. You have day one, day two, day three. You see John, you see Jesus. After John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. Amen. That's day three. And after this, it talks about some of the things that Jesus did. And when you get to verse 43, it says, and the day following, what day would that be? Well, that'd be day four. Amen. Everybody with me? Everybody say day four. Okay, now remember, Jesus comes on the fourth day, on the fourth millennium. That's when Jesus was sent from heaven to earth to die for our sins and pay the price, pay, pay the price uh, for our sins. He would shed his blood, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. So we see Jesus on the fourth day. It says... Uh, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he finds Philip, and he says unto him, follow me. Now, if you keep reading the verse in John chapter 1, you'll read the rest of the chapter, and you don't see Jesus anymore. See, when Jesus came on the fourth day, he gave his life for us, and he died, and nobody saw him again until three days later. And what was the purpose of that? It was just to pay the price for his bride so that they could be married. Amen. That was the function. That, that's why Jesus came. And so you read the re rest of uh, John chapter 1, and you don't see Jesus anymore. You see the first day, second day, third day, fourth day. That's when Jesus dies for us. And then you don't see him again. again. Until you get to John chapter 2, verse 1, and it says this. And the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. Whoa, wait a minute. That's when Jesus rose from the grave, the third day. And what did he do that for? So he could get married to his bride. There's a marriage. 
So we see a pattern here in, in the first and second chapter of John. And the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Let me tell you something. In the last days, and we're living in the last days, when Gabriel blows his trumpet, amen, uh, Jesus is going to return for his bride. And, and he's not just going to return by himself, but all of his disciples are going to come with him. Amen. Those who receive Jesus the Lord are going to return with him. Amen. And that's what this says, that Jesus is invited to this wedding and his disciples came with him. This is amazing. We see this event in the first and second chapter, a timeline of the first and second coming of the Messiah. And then we're about to see the first miracle of Jesus. Now, before we see it, another amazing thing is Isaiah 46 says this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there's none other. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I tell you what's going to happen at the end from the beginning. John came to identify Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Why did Jesus come? the Lamb of God, who's going to pay the price for our sins. Amen. He's going to die that we might live. The Son of God became a man so men could become the sons of God. He became a curse at Calvary so we wouldn't be cursed. Amen. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. That's what Jesus came to do. That's the end of his ministry. But God says, I tell you the end of the ministry at the beginning of the ministry, and we're getting ready to see the beginning of his miracles. It's getting started. He's about to do his first miracle. And in the first miracle, we see his last miracle. Amen. God is showing us something here. Isaiah says God declares the end from the beginning. And now we're going to the beginning to this wedding. We just found this prophetic timeline. We see Jesus coming on the fourth millennium, paying his price for the bride. He suffers, dies, and, and is buried. And then on the third day, he rises again victoriously. He had just been baptized by John in the Jordan River. And he's challenged by the devil. His ministry is about to begin. And he shows up at a wedding. We're reading about things which are, things which were, and which, and which are to come. See, John said, this is the lamb slain from the foundation a long time ago. But this is him right now, present day. And I'm telling you about the work he's going to do in the future. Wow, isn't that amazing? When we read this, see, God is God who is, who was, and is to come. And we're reading about what is and what was and what is to come. Amen. That's God's nature. And John tells us, look, I'm not the Christ. I baptize with the water. It's a temporary thing. Water is just a symbol. It's a cleansing, but it's a, you, you got to keep cleansing. When, when the priests would go into the holy place, they'd have to wash their hands and wash their feet. It was symbolic of washing their sins away. But they had to do it every time. If they went into the holy place every day, they had to do it every day. Because the water was just a picture. It didn't really wash your sins away. It's the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. And that's done once. Amen. Right? Jesus is the lamb that's going to die for us and, and wash our sins away. And then we see these, these six water pots, you know, that I mentioned earlier. John chapter 2, verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three fur cans, about 25 gallons apiece. It says there's six water pots uh, after the manner of the purifying, the purification. That's what I just told you about, about the, uh, the labor. It was symbolic of being cleansed. It was just a picture. It was a type. See, the Jews had the water. They had the labor. But what they didn't have was the lamb. And that's what they needed. They needed the blood to wash their sins away. They had the water, but they, they, they needed the blood. And what did Jesus say represented the blood? In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, after the same manner he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. See, when Jesus partook of communion, he said, the bread represents the body, the wine represents my blood. You have the water, which is a temporary cleansing. What you don't have is the blood. What you need is the blood. Jesus died and shed his blood for the remission of our sin. That was his purpose. That's why God sent him into the world. This is what's taking place. Jesus knew why he was come to the world. He knew what his ministry was. Now we're getting a clearer picture of what's taking place here. He knows this. 
He's invited to a wedding. He knows his ministry is just about to take off. He, he's he's going to do his first miracle soon. He arrives at a wedding and his disciples with him. And his mother approaches him and says, we have no wine. You're the Lamb of God. You're going to die for us. You're going to shed your blood for us. We have the water, but we don't have the wine. Jesus, you need to provide the wine. You need to shed your blood for us. And he says, woman, what are you talking about? My hour has not yet come. I'm not going to die today. My ministry is just getting started. Now you kind of understand why he responded the way he did. He shows up to a wedding. He knows what this is about. It's about his purpose. And he walks in. The first thing that happens is his mother says, Jesus, we have no wine. And I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit told Mary what to say. Mary, go to your son and tell him, we have no wine. Jerusalem has no wine. We have the water, but we're, but we're seeking the lamb to shed his blood. And she says, son, we have no wine. Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has not yet come. He wasn't saying it's not my time to do a miracle. If it wasn't his time to do a miracle, he wouldn't have done a miracle. He was saying it's not my time to shed my blood on the cross. Give me a break. It, my, 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 my ministry is just getting started. I'm not going to die today. Woman, what have I to do with thee? And then Mary says this. She knows by inspiration of the Holy Ghost she's supposed to ask that question. And I imagine she looked at the son and said, I don't know what he's going to do, but something's going to happen. <laughs> and she turns to the servant and she says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And that would be good advice for all of us, wouldn't it? Man, whatever the Lord tells you to do, do it. Yeah, but no, 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 buts. Get your butt out of the way. Amen. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And you'll be better off. Amen. She, it's like she just ignores him. Son, we have no wine. He says, woman, it's not my hour. My hour's not come. And then he probably came to himself, oh, they're out of wine. <laughs> I thought she was talking about something else. She said, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And he looks and he sees six water pots and he knows what it's about. That's man's timeline. That's why I'm sent, I'm sent here to turn the water into wine. I'm sent here to change the temporary forgiveness to a permanent forgiveness. That's my purpose. That's my destiny. He tells the servants, come with me. And he turns the water into wine. Are you getting a better idea of what was taking place here? Isn't it amazing? I believe the Holy Spirit was directing his mother exactly what to say. In John chapter 2, Jesus said to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour. And it's interesting the way he said it. Mine hour is not yet come. Somebody say, mine hour. He didn't say my time. He said, mine hour is not yet come. And his mother says unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you to do, do it. Whatever he saith unto you, do it. Another clue that the bride gives us is when Jesus was in the garden praying with his disciples later on in life. He knew he had been betrayed. You remember the disciples were there and, and, and Peter fell asleep and Jesus said, you're sleeping? I really need you to pray. Have you ever asked somebody to pray? And, and say, I, I, I really need you to pray. Don't just tell me you're going to pray. But pray. Pray hard. Because <laughs> I, I, I got a real big issue I got to deal with. And I want you to pray for me. Jesus knew he was about to go to Calvary. He was about to go to the cross. He said, pray. And he came in and they were sleeping. He said, wake up. Pray. He came back later. They're, still, they're sleeping again. Man, can't you all just pray for an hour? And he goes back to pray and he's sweating like it's drops of blood. I mean, he's. And then he says, OK. The third time, Mark 14, 41. And he cometh the third time and he said unto them, sleep on now. Get your rest. It's enough. The hour is come. Behold, the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Remember, he told his mother, mine hour is not yet come. And now he tells his disciples, my hour's come. This is it. See, when he went to that marriage, it was a picture of what was going to happen in the last day. And she says, we're out of wine. And he's seeing the last day. He's saying, I'm not shedding my blood today. My hour's not yet come, Mom. 
And I believe he came to himself and realized, oh, okay. And he turns the water to wine to show us what he's going to do. This is what I'm doing. But when it comes to the last day, right before the cross, he tells the disciples, this is it. Mine hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Wow. The entire conversation at the wedding feast was a picture for us of the work of the redemptive uh, work of Jesus Christ. The work that he would do for mankind. And after Jesus turns the water into the wine, look at what the governor of the, the wedding feast says in John chapter 2. And the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples, uh, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And his mother turns to the servants and says, whatever he says unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purification of the Jews, containing three fur kins apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear it to the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the, the uh, feast had tasted the wine, that was uh, the water, rather, that was made wine, and knew not from whence it was, but the servants that drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, you know, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have saved the good wine until now. You saved the best for the last. That's the nature of God. You know, we say morning and evening, life and death. That's not how it was. For, for God, he said the evening and the morning were the first day. He said we passed from death to life. The good wine was first. The last wine is the best. Amen? That's the nature of God. It says this is the beginning of miracles that Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. It, it says the Son of Man must be glorified. And he was going to be glorified. And his disciples believed on him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Man, as we come to the end of the story, what's it talking about? Passover. What's Passover? It's a rehearsal of the lamb being killed for the remission of our sin. The Passover lamb dying. This, this whole, this book, as you read it, the first chapters are talking about the purpose for Jesus coming to the world. Now we get a better picture of why when he showed up to this wedding and his mother said, Jesus, we have no wine. He said, woman, give me a break. I'm just getting started. Oh, you mean this kind of wine? I, I, I'm sorry. You just kind of caught me by surprise. Fill those water pots. I'm going to show you something <laughs> that's about to take place. Jesus died for man and he's going to return. And his return is going to be in the early morning hours of the seventh day. Remember, he comes on the fourth day, he dies. And on the third day, he rises again. Four and three is seven. So in the early morning hours of the seventh millennium, he, he's going to show up. In the early morning hours of the seventh millennium. That's what the Bible teaches us. The year 1999, that, that was 2000, it's, it's 1999 A.D., Anno Domine, it means year of our Lord. It means Jesus came at the year 4,000, 2,000 years later, 1999, 2000. That's two days or two millennium after he came. The time that we're living in now, 2,000 plus 2022, that is the early morning hours of the third day. That's when Jesus rose. See, Jesus is coming soon for his bride. We see the signs all around us. You got to wear a mask. You won't be able to buy or sell without it. You won't be able to go in a restaurant without it. You won't be able to get a job without it. You, you, you got to do this. Sounds like revelation, doesn't it? It's getting close. Are you ready? <laughs> ready or not, he's coming. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen. Today, I'm Pastor Richard Rodriguez. I want to invite you to join us right here uh, in person uh, at Christian Life Center. We're located in Kingwood, Texas. 
Our address is 806 Russell Palmer Road. We're right behind the uh, Fine Arts Community Center here in Kingwood called the Nathaniel Center. It's located right behind it. Come out and join us. We'd love to have you here. And would you consider supporting the ministry? You know, you can give an offering by simply texting the number there on your screen, 940-241-4450. Or you can go to our website, clc-church, clc-church.com, and you can give there. You can also have access to our school and daycare information on those programs. We'd love to have you uh, enroll your children, your grandchildren. Uh, your neighbors, amen, anyone you'd like in our school and daycare program, they'll love it. We have an exciting children's program that your kiddos will love, amen. And uh, we'd love to have you join us here. So thank you so much for watching again. And listen, subscribe to the channel and click that little notification bell so that uh, you'll be alerted when new messages air. And once again, thank you for watching. God bless you, amen.